going beyond the headlines. Asking the questions you want answered. Exploring government policies and how they impact you. We are delving deeper. Good evening and welcome to Delving Deeper. I am your host, Sunil Lala. Joining us this evening is the chairman of the sports company of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Douglas Camacho. Mr. Camacho, good evening and welcome back to Delving Deeper. Thank you very much, Sunil. It's a pleasure as always. So let's start with what exactly is the role and function of the sports company of Trinidad and Tobago. Right. Well, when it was first founded, the company, sports company, the intention was for it to be responsible for the 12 major sporting bodies in the country, national governing bodies. It was then expanded to 15, as well as to include the responsibility for the physical infrastructure, sporting facilities, the major stadia, the cycle velodrome, etc. That is under the control of the Ministry of Sport and Community Development. So that had been the primary purpose. In the recent past, in the last two or three years, the minister has also requested that Sport TT be the representative for the implementation of many of the policies that the country has determined are the policies for sport. In particular, when we host major international events, Sport TT, through myself as the chairman of Sport TT, uh, usually appointed chair of the local organizing committee for the various major events being held in the country, where the support is coming from state funding. In terms of the sports company of Trinidad and Tobago, how long has it been around and what are some of its success stories? Well, it's been around quite a few decades now and I would say the major, the major success it has achieved has really been in to streamline the responsibility of the national governing bodies and the relationship between national governing bodies and funds from the state. And this has been so uh, long before I was chairman of Sport TT, back in the day when in fact I was a president of a national governing body and president of the Olympic Committee. So we're going back, you know, 1996, circa that, thereabouts. So it's a while now, 20 something years that, you know, it has played a myriad set of roles. Success wise, and I mean, uh, we all, and we won't dwell on the spectacular um, failures that has been attributed to Sport TT, perhaps through no fault or of their own and other factors, but certainly the, the major success factors, I would say has been the relationship that has developed between Sport TT and the national governing bodies, where the national governing bodies are now held accountable by Sport TT for certainly the funds that are advanced on behalf of the state. So us tax, you know, us taxpayers, when our funds are advanced, the responsibility is there. You know, we're often asked, what about funding that comes to national governing bodies from other entities and do we oversee that? The, the short answer to that would have been not in a direct way. We don't have remit over that because our responsibility is for the funds that the state has provided. But certainly we get sight of it because they do account to us fully every year. And we have a matrix that has been developed that will allow us to rank national sporting bodies based on them meeting and the criteria that we have established in the matrix, which includes things like proper governance, having proper financial accounts audited, audited by enterprises or individuals who are accredited to the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Trinidad and Tobago. So credible reporting and not you know, just your friend, your appoint as an auditor sort of thing that may have pervaded in the past. And what we have found is a general uptick and increase in the responsibility of national governing bodies, particularly in the last five to six years. We have noted that trend. And you know, the, the, there has been a relationship developed along the way now where, in fact, the collaboration between the national governing bodies and Sport TT is perhaps as best it has been, certainly in the last 15, 20 years. So that's a good sign. From the, the macro perspective, in terms of the hosting of national events, I think Sport TT demonstrated unequivocally, particularly during that COVID period, 
when given the responsibility of leading the local organizing committees in that instance for the IPL, etc., that they have now developed a capability and capacity to deliver on those events, you know, in a way that has never been done, I presume, before. So that has worked particularly well. And they, you know, often, and I must put in a plug here, often, you know, people in the public sector, public service, the, the agencies, you know, be it police, fire, airports authority, CAL, you know, the, the boats, the, everything that goes into the successful hosting of a national event, particularly when it's on two islands, both islands at the same time, like the Commonwealth Youth Games or the football tournaments over the years. I must say that my experience in the last six or seven years has been that those people that come from the public sector have really delivered. You know, people often pillory them about how terrible the public service is and you can't get anything done. Not my experience. I mean, if I use the local T20 World Cup, which, you know, we were asked to chair the local part of it for and have done for the last year and change, I must say that, you know, what we have seen is exceptional service, selfless service, you know, and, and perhaps you know, people like the police and the fire and those are kind of virtually invisible to people. But without the security that goes at an international event like that, being right on point, we could run into trouble. You know, the medical capability came in for high praise during the Commonwealth Youth Games. Cal, the sea bridge, everything, you know, has been really on point. Airports Authority, there was one, one officer there, and I know, shouldn't be calling names and so on or identifying people, but... I mean, he literally, to a night into day, he would make it his business. I know we're not talking overtime or extra pay here. He made it his business that even when off duty, he would be there when international teams were coming in, when the countries were coming in, and ensure that there was complete seamlessness. I mean, we have it down to such a science as an LOC now that just using this T20, we timed it just out of um, keeping track of data because we're very much into that now, you know, capturing the data, doing data analytics to help guide the future, but as well as to see the success of the past. And we literally could bring a, land a whole team or a whole country, a whole aircraft in and have them from the ramp to the buses in under 15 minutes. You know, of course, all the things have to be in place, you know, the, the luggage reporters, the, everything, but it's worked seamlessly. So I must say, you ask for successes, I would, I would highlight those. I suppose there are always areas for improvement, you know, and, and, and we know that the country's financial state, uh, see the IMF says it's moving in the right direction. I hope we can see that translated into more funds for sport, but the reality is we also had a summer note from the Minister of Finance in the recent half-year review where he mentioned, you know, about the challenges of Revenue diminishing, you know, and the, the, the gas and oil production not at the levels it used to be, which are the mainstay for the national economy. And therefore, things could become tight and you need, therefore, for ensuring they collect additional taxes, etc., and make sure that all the taxes are due are, in fact, collected and paid over and so on. So, I mean, that might not be quite the sign we wanted, but I think that's a reality check. And it does constrain us, to be very blunt, I mean, we would love the funds to do proper maintenance, for instance, on all the facilities so that we do preventative and not reactive so that we could ensure that things don't go down and not have to fix it after it goes down. But the reality is we just don't have the funds to do it in that sort of very, very professional way it ought to be done. Now, you did mention that the sports company plays a particular role when uh, some of the, these national governing bodies are given money by the state. Just about two weeks ago, we saw the sports uh, ministry expend uh, close to about $16 million to these national, national governing bodies, these sports bodies and so on. Uh, what role does the sports company play in this? Right. Well, again, as I say, we're responsible for 15. So all the ones that would have received funding that are within the 15, we would have vetted those, things, those applications over the period of time and make the recommendation. The process really is that the sports company liaises with the NGBs, the NGBs provide the data, we do all the analytics on it, we then make the recommendation to the Ministry of Sport, which is our line ministry, because we are, an, we are a 
a limited liability company, but a state enterprise. And um, we make recommendations to our ministry. They will go through it, put it through their, their um, processes and procedures, then forward their recommendation if they support it or otherwise to the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance will then release the funds to the Ministry of Sport. And that's an interesting thing I'll come back to in a minute. Releases it to the Ministry of Sport and the Ministry of Sport then provides it and makes it available to Sport TT to provide to the NGBs. In a circumstance like that, there would be one or two NGBs that would be receiving that may be outside of the remit of Sport TT per se, in which case those would be directly done through the Ministry. So the Ministry of Sport handles the other, you know, 35, 40 other entities that would be applying for assistance. And we just handle the top or major 15. Now, the thing I wanted to look back to there was that that, was a, that is the characteristic that is a unique challenge it has presented in that the sports company is a state enterprise and does not have the authority to actually retain or receive revenue. So very often, you know, people from the public could make the comment, but when you all rent it out, the whole purpose of renting out stadia around the world, you know, whether it's Wembley in the UK, Maracana in Brazil, wherever, is to get, the re to get re additional revenue from non-sporting activity to help sustain the sporting activity. The reality is when we do collect, you know, whether it's big concerts or whatever, we don't get it. The funds go directly to the consolidated fund. So all the funds that Sport TT gets are in fact by way of subvention from the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And you know, that is one of the areas where I'm hopeful that we could have it modified. And at, at the last hearing that Sport TT had before one of the um, parliamentary committees, you know, we got the assurance from all the parties, the government side, the opposition, and the independents, that that is something that they would all support. You know, once we could bring the necessary, I guess it will require some legislation, and that is in the pipeline. We have done our part, provided the information to our ministry who has gone through it, and they will be forwarding it to the relevant, I guess the Solicitor General or whoever it is has to prepare those bits of legislation, and hopefully it will get the support. If we could change that, what we are hoping to do is to make some of the major facilities self-funding and remove the burden completely from the state, if not completely, at, le at least partially. So to take as an example the, I don't know, the cycle velodrome, if we could retain the revenue and we could go out and get, say, sponsorship, you know, akin to what is done in most other places in the world, where we could get a major title sponsor to call the facility after, you know. So, you know, if you follow basketball, you'll be familiar. You know, they're going to play the American Airlines Arena or whatever. So if we could do that and get the kind of revenue that would allow us to either supplement what the state provides as subvention and or become completely independent eventually of the consolidated fund. Obviously, it's the state assets. So it would be on behalf of the state, but it would remove some of that burden from the treasury. Because that's another thing that people say. What about getting the private sector more involved? And that's fine, and we do get them involved, but more particularly in partnership with NGBs rather than directly through Sport TT because of those constraints. So, you know, it's in our strategic plan for the 24 28 period, and hopefully, it's something that sooner rather than later, hopefully by, you know, maybe the next time you all invite me here, maybe in 25, that 2025, next year, in a couple of months' time, hopefully we could say, well, you know, that thing we discussed is now a reality and we now have the capability to retain, receive and retain revenue. But that is an, that is an impediment. Of course, when that 16 million was expended uh, to the national governing bodies, uh, the sports minister, Shamfa Gujul Lewis, she did say that uh, a lot of these uh, national governing bodies had late submissions and may not have been able to get the funding. Have you seen this happening and do you liaise with these? Oh yes, NGOs? absolutely. Well, it's two, two dimensions to that. Some of them are definitely a little tardy. You know, we have requested that they give us three months because in the process I just described to you, you could just imagine it. It comes in from the NGBs, they provide a thing, Sportiti might have questions, they go back to the NGB and that iteration, we try to complete within a couple of weeks. Sport TD then has its own governance structure. 
where that will be reviewed by a subcommittee of the board who would opine on it, you know, really do the heavy lifting, as we call it, and make a recommendation to the board. Once the board approves it, and we meet the, sec the fourth, fourth Tuesday of every month is our board meetings, predetermined, unless it's a public holiday. And at that meeting, once approved by the board, the next day, the documentation will then go down to the Ministry of Sport, who will then go through their process to send it to the Ministry of Finance, who then have to go through their budgets and all the various um, governance structures there to then release the money to the Ministry of Sport. And of course, like everybody else, I'm sure the Minister of, Sport, Minister, the Minister of Finance in this case manages, has to manage his cash flow in the same way. So he will not appreciate today for tomorrow kind of thing. So it's, it's why we have asked them to come three months in advance. <clears throat> now, most of them would meet the deadline. What happens? Some don't, not because they couldn't have, but because they aren't as well organized as we would like. Most NGBs, except the very large ones like football, cricket, maybe track and field, don't really have full-time staff. A lot of it is still voluntary, just because of the economics. So there are, there are reasons why, perhaps, but the reason doesn't take away that better organization and better communication can make it happen. That is one. Two, the second thing that happens is very often the international bodies have not determined sufficiently well in advance to meet that three-month deadline what the event is. And that creates its own problem because then something will come up, you know, like take football. You know, football will put out a schedule and then you qualify and you get to the next stage. By the time you get those dates, sometimes it's within the three month period because there are windows that they use using football as the example. And therefore they will not meet the deadline on occasion. And we do have circumstances where we try to accommodate. And what we ask the NGBs is give us the pathway. So taking football as the example, since that's very topical, they would know the pathway to the World Cup or the Olympics, or the various events they want to participate in, right? Give us the whole pathway. We know when you stop at a hurdle that you can't get over, because you haven't qualified to go on, that pathway would end, and we could focus elsewhere. But don't wait until you know to decide. Now, you may not have the information, and therefore that's another challenge. So you might know whether you're going to be playing in Croatia, or in Miami, and that will be hugely different in costs and everything. But at least let us know so that we have a, some foresight so we could plan for it. That is one. The other area that we have really tightened on in that regard is the area of bidding for events domestically. Because of our good facilities, well, I would say better than good, excellent facilities that we have here in many of the sports, we are able to bid and very often asked to bid by international governing bodies and federations. And in bidding, that process is now, we will, we're trying to refine it in the same way we did with the NGBs here, that they must not go and commit to a bid unless they have the sign off. And many international bodies require the sign off of the host government. But that they should get that before, then bid, rather than bid get the bid and then come and ask, because that creates its own challenge. So we're getting them there, and I, you know, I'd use as an example 2025 Carifta, which is many, many months away. But Trinidad and Tobago, for the first time in a long time, will be hosting both track and field and swimming at the same time, because always at the Easter, that Easter weekend period. And that is unusual. The last time I think any country multiple hosted that event was said Trinidad and Tobago, when Penny Commission was the chairman, and they had now built Mount Tope Hospital, so you might not have been born. And um, they use that as the games village. That's to tell you when last that happened. And they went away, countries went away from that, found it difficult. The government has supported the bid for both track and field and swimming. That's a major event because you're talking concentrated period of about eight days. You're talking between the two sports, probably just athletes and officials alone, close to 2,000. And we all know what the hotel plant is like in Trinidad and Tobago, right? The advantage in this one, it will be at two very different venues, the AZ Crawford Stadium for track and field and the um, aquatic center. So at least you get that 
to avoid the, the, the additional challenges sometimes that go on with transportation. But it's a big challenge. And um, by coming early, we have already established a local organizing committee made up of the sport company, plus all those officials I've mentioned, all the agencies, governmental agencies that would have to be involved, as well as the two, in this case, the two national governing bodies, track and field and aquatics, with a view to ensuring that they don't trip over one another's feet, whether it is going after private sector sponsorship or whether it is going after the human resource. Because an interesting thing has emerged over the last couple of years, that when one asks for volunteers, whatever the sport, there are cadre of people now who literally would take holidays and volunteer their time for free to come and be a part of the exercise. So we don't want to tripping over one another's feet. So we have already established an LOC that has already started operating at, you know, maybe a handful of meetings already. And well, anyway, and that is April 2025. And even that is not early, let me say, to properly plan. You, you know, really you should be planning two years out. So again, it's a role that Sport TT has been asked to participate in by the current minister, and we have done so, and hopefully we are delivering, certainly for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, as asked. A few moments ago, you spoke about the National Aquatic Centre. Mm -hmm. Are we making full use of all our facilities, including the National Aquatic Centre, the Racket Centre, and many of these stadia across the country? Yeah, um, the challenge, I think, for me, as a sports person, is the period in the morning after schools start till schools come out in an afternoon. What you find is if, if there's any downtime in facilities, it's then. And then everybody wants that period after work till 7, 8 in the evenings, right? And that is a challenge. We don't have a, a culture in the, in the country of utilizing those free spots, right? If you look around at school grounds, I went to St. Mary's College, right? And if you look at St. Mary's College ground during the day, beautiful facility, Fatima, QRC, just the ones in Port of Spain, let alone the prayers, naps, and everywhere, ev everywhere else. And I would suggest to you that if you did that look through, you would see that during school periods, all of those grounds are empty. Now, the reality is to optimize the use if community groups could do it, but then they're working. And if you're not working you're in school. So you find that there's that concentration. But during the available periods or the desired periods, I would say, yes, it is used. Certainly the aquatic center is used almost every day. Um, once it is not a major meet going on and then it's used for the meet. The cycle velodrome virtually every day. The racket center, definitely every day. The, the challenge with the racket center, in fact, is the competing demands for time because it is the racket center. So it's table tennis, traditional tennis, used to be called lawn tennis, badminton. So, you know, you have, in the case of badminton and table tennis, they need the indoor to avoid the breeze, but there are also indoor tennis courts, which is what, you know, the area that would be used by badminton and table tennis also and particularly in the rainy season the competition for time is tight so we actually kind of meet with those three plus sport TT to try and develop a schedule like a year in advance and even that gets turned upside down when last minute we ask the host something one of our teams get through juniors get through and in the case of the traditional lawn tennis arrangement because we have been pushing for the certification as an ITF center. They have been asking us to host a lot of events, partnering with TAT, which is the local body, to put on a lot of events. And those often come with less than a three months notice, not demanding necessarily, necessarily cash input, but certainly demanding or asking of us for the availability. So it becomes that scheduling challenge in that particular center. In the case of aquatics, less so. In the case of cycling, less so. You do get clashes, but not as frequently as at the tennis center. 
And those two others that I mentioned, the aquatic center and the cycle velodrome, well, the cycle velodrome has already received the status that we're seeking for the tennis and the aquatic center as a UCI accredited center. You might remember about two years ago, a year and a half ago, there was a big ceremony to acknowledge that. We're pretty close with the Tennis Association of Trinidad and Tobago. We have, we have hired the necessary people to make it happen. Um, we've, we're well on the way, and hopefully that will allow us sport TT now, but working in partnership with that, and even on our own, to be able to start running those programs, hopefully making use to, 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 to your question of particularly the dead spots. You know, if we could bring it out, maybe have seniors who might be retired, try to encourage them, get them into programs. Schools, if, you know, schools could make more use of it. During school hours as part of the, their own development, and I, I know I'm probably stepping in a lot of parents' cones when I say that, because a lot of them still believe that sport and culture and other things are a distraction from, from, from their formal education. Well, I beg to differ, I think that is a fallacy. I think well-rounded children perform better ultimately, certainly in life, and probably even at their schoolwork, if they were to be engaged in meaningful other activities. I make the plug for sport because that's my passion, but equally I can make the plug for things like culture, singing, dance, you know, arts, whatever, cadets, scouts, etc. et al. So challenges, plenty. Solutions, available. I hear you talking about bidding and Carifta and where uh, where's the big in the mix in this? Is the Dwight York Stadium accredited uh, internationally? And uh, we recently saw, you know, uh, the Soccer Warriors, the Trinidad Vega football team, uh, draw two all with Grenada. Can we possibly see some matches across in Tobago at the Dwight York Stadium? Well, yes, actually, it is accredited. And right now, at this moment, it is in good condition. A lot of refurbishment work has gone into it. The track in Tobago, the running track, under the, uh, into the, the uh, Athletics Federation, the National Athletics Federation rules, both the Dwight York and the Hazley Crawford came to its natural life at the end of December last year. Now, we got a specific exemption for the Hazley Crawford to allow our athletes in this Olympic year to prepare for the Olympics, train there, and to participate in meets that would meet the criteria for accreditation for the Olympic Games. So it was a concession that we requested and got from the regulatory body to allow it. But the reality is that that particular track, at the end of this month, June, we'd be shutting down the Hazley Crawford to redo the track and to redo the surface, the grass. You know, it needs, you know, resanding and redoing. It looks in good condition, it is, but for international, you've got to keep it that way. Back to the preventative stuff. We've gotten the approval, the cabinet has approved the funds for that. So that work will start on the 1st of July because we then have to complete everything before Karifta next year because by January we want it to be over, done and dusted so that we could start having competition there and, 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 and the test events, particularly in track and field. With regard to the football, when this one is shut down, Atto Bolan and Dwight York would be the two primary facilities that the FA would use for preparing for their World Cup events. And yes, Dwight York has been used in the past for international football events, men and women, boys and girls. We've actually held a World Cup, Junior World Cup, in, you know, using Dwight York as one of the four stages. It was built for that purpose back in the day when I had a different hat um, at Guardian when RGM had built it in time for the World Cup then, the, the, the first stadium. So it has been used and will continue to be used. And very often, we encourage, we sport it, encourage the FA to have games over there. Um, we have a new, a new FA executive, as you know, recently installed. Hopefully they will see the wisdom as well. Because I would tell you, you tend to get very good support when you carry the game to Tobago, in-person support. I personally estimated somewhere between eight and a half and nine thousand people, patrons at the at the game, which was a good sign, really good sign. Um, yes, the two all mightn't be the result that we would have liked, but we're still in the frame. Nobody's ahead of us in our pool, so it's completely within our capacity or the capacity of the Trinidad and Tobago team and the, the 
coaching staff, etc., to do what is required to be done to take us into the next phase. Back to the point I was making about pathway. Once we get through this pool, then we get into the next phase and the next phase, and you have a whole process, whether it's to the World Cup or to the you know, Gold Cup or the various other activities, both at senior and junior level, men and women, boys and girls. You did say you were going to shut down the Hazel Crawford Stadium to, the re to, redo, to redo the, the track and so on. And the, and the, and the playing yeah. surface for football. Is there a budget uh, that you've uh, estimated for this? Yeah, um, for that part of it, and I want to be very clear, because you know, then somebody will go down and take a picture of a wall where the paint may have peeled and said, but they didn't do that that what we are doing here is the track and the field. And the budget was around 25 million TT or thereabouts. Um, to get the exact figures, if it would matter. Certainly it would have been in a press release that was done some time ago. And it is our intention, as we did, to continue advising the public exactly what is happening. We had put out the advertisements well in advance, reminding everybody, having liaised with all the NGBs that make use of the ASD Crawford Stadium that come the 30th of this month, it will be closed. We have deferred it, in fact, to the 30th to allow for everybody in their preparation for the Olympics that start next month um, to be able to train and prepare. So they have ample notice to make all the alternative arrangements, keep informing the public, you know, and everybody, so nobody gets it as a surprise. And likewise, you know, we, we, we will ensure that it's, at the end of the day, it's not us anyway, it will be the international bodies who certify certainly the track for track and field, the football less so. Football is more the dimensions than, than anything. And ours, our surfaces in the football, the ones that we have responsibility for at sport, are really good. We have even Manny Ramjohn in San Fernando in Marabella, which is, you know, and the problem there with lights that we need to do and some other things, but in terms of the surface, excellent conditions. So all of our Football surfaces, excellent condition. The ICC T20 International World Cup is underway. We saw a, a warm-up match between Australia and the West Indies at, at the Oval. Um, later this week, we're going to see West Indies versus New Zealand at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy. Tell us about, from the perspective of the sports company of Trinidad and Tobago, how was the preparation? Again, as I, as I said, just generally, in things where we have chaired the um, local organising committees, we have found tremendous support from the agencies. We actually ran a dry run, which is how I could give you the statistics, of just people coming in on a flight from New York, landing in the airport, and getting them to curbside from, from the gate to the curbside, and timed it, 15 minutes, everybody outside. And that was as a dry run before this games, before the first athletes, before the first countries arrived. And it has worked extremely well. We have everything in place for it. The facilities we're using are three warm-up facilities and practice facilities would be Diego Martin, UE Spec, and the Queen's Park Oval, with the tournament games being played in Brian Lara. What is also very interesting is the only T20 World Cup warm-up game match to which the public was invited was that one you alluded to at the Queen's Park Oval between the West Indies and Australia. All others are behind closed doors. And traditionally, they have always been behind closed doors. So that was a, a concession, if you like, that was hard won by, by the LOC. Because you're dealing, remember, cricket is a unique thing in the Caribbean. It is not a territory that participates on behalf of. So it's not Trinidad and Tobago or Barbados or Jamaica or Guyana or Antigua. It is the West Indies. So you're dealing, first of all, with the combination of all the islands. So as an LOC, you are representing Trinidad and Tobago, making sure that Trinidad and Tobago delivers first to the Caribbean, our people, right? Which is, the, which is led by the Cricket West Indies. And the Vice Chairman of Cricket West Indies is the President of the Trinidad Cricket Board. He co-chaired with me that local committee, as in Bazarat. You then have the ICC, who owns the rights to the tournament. And what people often don't realize is when you sign on to these international tournaments, you basically give up your rights to them. What they are doing is you are hosting them, but it's their tournament. So I'd meet friends who would say, but you're the chairman of that. 
you must tell them this and they have to do that and you say we're the host there's a contract that says what your role as the host is and what their role is and i keep saying to people the contract is what guides you so the contract does not give you rights they don't assume those rights just because and every contract has obligations you have to fulfill those and i have to say that i have had exceptional support from the agencies to the point where I even asked the ICC for a concession to provide tickets to all the members of the LOC. Because literally they'd come 40, 50 of them to every meeting. On time, religiously spend the whole time going through raising very pertinent questions, going back, responding promptly and delivering a seamless, world-class representation for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And so they provided them with some tickets for that warm-up game. They gave the concession to allow it to happen. Had about, what, 8,000 to 10,000 people, I guess, in the Oval. As a little token of appreciation. But it has worked very well so far. Not good, right? It's, it's, you know, major events like that are fraught with all kinds of challenges, from security to medical to visas, to, but it has worked extremely well so again kudos not to me but certainly to the agencies for really stepping up for the red white and black to deliver a non-red white and black program a caribbean program we did have we did have that warm-up game and we do have a couple of group matches as well and correct me if i'm wrong but i think we have a, a semi-final semi -final, match as yeah. well in terms of the amount of matches we brought, and I know this would have taken place uh, a good few years or a good few months ago in terms of the bidding, but do you think we could have gotten, uh, you know, more matches in Trinidad? Well, that rests with, again, as I say, the owners of the product, which is the ICC. So the ICC would have identified some packages and asked people to bid. And you'll be putting in your bid, but they would be guiding you and letting you know, well, this is what is required for what, right? And you don't get to cherry pick. So you don't get to say, well, I want this game from this pool and that game from that pool. That's not how it happens. They put it together from the ICC's perspective and then say, these are the packages. Do you have an interest? And of course, in this particular instance, you had the USA and the Caribbean. Now, when you think of the Caribbean, five islands is five venues. The USA is three venues, but one country. So you might say six, but it's not six, because the West Indies is seen as the West Indies, the you know, cricket West Indies, as one, and the USA as one. So we ended up with five venues, with the US with three. Um, well, you see the press reports, right? You're getting some negative comments about the pitches in New York, because of that drop-in pitch. But I will guarantee you, you will only get positive comments about the pitches in Trinidad, even the warmer pitches, whether it's the training in Diego Martin, whether they're playing in the Queen's Park Oval or, you, you know, Upper Time, you respect, and definitely in Brian Lara, which perhaps is the best pitch in the Caribbean. Switching gears, we're going to be seeing the Summer Olympics in late July, early August, in those first two weeks in August. Um, in terms of funding for our athletes, do you have any idea how many athletes are going to be performing and in terms of funding, if it's been expended to them? Right, well, two things happen then. First is the preparation. So in the preparation period, again, pathway. So team sports, I'll take hockey as an example, my former sport, has a process to qualify. If you drop off the qualification process, the support to that will, will automatically come to an end. So they would have had, in that case, I use hockey as the example, support that got them to the point you have to win the Pan American Games. We didn't win it. Argentina, the normal winners there have been winning it, I think, except for twice in the history of the event. And they top five ranked in the world kind of thing. They made it. You're out. You know you're out. Individual athletes, different. They go a lot later. And theirs is primarily based on time. So in the case of swimming and track and field, it will be based on meeting certain times, standards as it's called, for the event. And what... What you find the NGBs and, and the government would do is we would support the athletes in the prep, as well as the Olympic Committee. So the Olympic Committee has its own fund, which 
they work in partnership with the, with the state to ensure that athletes are funded in prep. But in the case of those, you have very late people still trying to qualify. There's a cutoff period, middle of this month, for qualification. So people are still on the pathway. Boxing, another one. You would know of recent um, activity where two or three boxers still in line. One girl, two boys have gone away to compete. Again, that's the other problem. You have to go to compete to qualify. So there's a qualification process. In the case of cycling, that qualification process is built up over time by getting a certain number of points that qualifies you. So they would have gone to the UCI qualifiers, again, all around the world. It might be Japan, Australia, Russia, all over the world, and participate to get the points to get in. So we have some cyclists, we have some track and field going, some swimmers. We still have a chance of a boxer, well, a boxer may or two may get in, you know. And boxing is pretty much luck of the draw because one of the qualifiers is going to meet the previous Olympic champion to try to qualify. So, yeah, you know, that, that is how the, the draw sometimes happens. And if you meet them and they beat you early out, if you win, you win and you're in. So it's a process. So we as a, we as a body, the way we support is twofold, right? We would encourage, of course, the, the government to fund, and there's a process very well defined. If you rank a certain way in elite status, if you rank as a up and coming, which determines the quantum you get. Then we make facilities available. So as I say, we specifically got the international body to extend the period we had certification at the, the Crawford Stadium for to allow our athletes that opportunity. Swimming, we make the pool available, et cetera, et cetera. Velodrome, we make available so that we make it available to the athletes. So through Sport ET, we provide on behalf of the state the physical infrastructure for them to try to achieve. And then for the Games itself, the Olympic Committee takes responsibility for Olympic events and the funds, if any, that the state provides would be to the Olympic Committee. Plus, of course, the international body provides them with some assistance. And that is primarily how the process works for the Olympic Games. So when these athletes receive the money for the preparation in terms of the Summer Olympics in Paris, do they have to account for it? Definitely, both from the Olympic Committee and from the state. So very often they would get different types of funding from the two. And yes, the obligation is on them to then report after the event, after the fact, so they, and bring in the, the, the supporting documentation to support the spend. So they would put up a budget which comes forward. And as I say, there's a criteria, so they may put a budget up for five million. But if the criteria, for instance, let's just say is 300,000 if you're at this level or 200,000 if you're at that level, you would then have to bring the bills to justify the 200, the 300 after the fact. So that going forward, you would continue to enjoy the privilege, right? Because it's not a right, it's a privilege to get funding. And similarly with the Olympic Committee, their funding comes through the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, who provides to them funding that they could then make available to these athletes. The athletes then have to account to the TTOC, who in their case then has to account to the IOC for why Douglas got X funding. Look, this is his bills, everything in order. They verify it, they pass it on to the IOC, so the IOC will continue to fund. So it's, it's a perpetual accounting for good governance to ensure that the money is spent how the money is supposed to be spent. Have these athletes been doing that? I can't say specifically for the ones who got this time, but historically, to be very blunt, that has been a bit of a challenge for some. And in the past, certainly back in the day when I was um, president of the Olympic Committee, what we had realized is that very often they aren't always as focused on the financial record keeping as they are on the training, understandable, to an extent. But it comes with responsibility. So what we used to do then, and I've been encouraged Sport TT to make themselves available to do on behalf of athletes, is we would baby them, is what my, my colleagues on the board would say. You know, I call it hold their hand, right? Because I recognize that you could be a brilliant doctor, but a terrible financial person, right? Because everybody has different strengths. And so we'd try to hold their hand to help them complete. 
And I used to literally tell them, put all your documents, all your receipts, all your into a manila envelope. You're training all over the world, so we, can, we don't expect you to bring it in tomorrow. I want you back home or you send it home. We'd sit with you and go through it and help you prepare it so that you are compliant and in accordance. I know that sounds like baby and holding a hand, but think of it. If you are not an expert in the area, sometimes you, you couldn't be bothered. That's a humbug for you kind of thing. So I have to say it's a mixed bag. Some are very good with it, very structured, very disciplined. Or maybe they have people who, their managers or whoever work with them to you know, help them put it together. And they very well meet their obligations in a timely manner and a very accurate manner. But mixed bag, I guess, like everything else. I'm not making excuses for them, but I think they need to do it and it should be so. And if they don't, then we should be very frank. No, no, no proper accounting, no more funds. They want to go to the press, you know, whoever, let them go. Let them tell the press and tell the press the story. I gave them your money as a taxpayer and we put in for them to account. End of story. Because that's what the Olympic Committee would do. Let's say we gave them the money from the IOC and they have not counted for it, they have no more to get. The Prime Minister is constantly talking about, uh, you know, corporate TNT getting involved in sport. Um, I've heard that many times from him at, at various assignments throughout uh, the last few years. And so, has this been happening? Have we had enough of corporate TNT in sport? Well, I have to put my hand up and say, I've been part of that corporate TNT, right? As you, as you know, right? Leading a, a, a big organization. And I would say it's a mixed bag. I think not nearly enough is the blunt answer as a sportsman. I don't think nearly enough. I think a lot of sporting organizations have brought that on themselves by their behavior. Uh, not necessarily, very often the, the leadership of an organization is, is the one where the focus lies, you know. And a lot of the blame goes there. But the reality is, a lot of the time, it's the unnecessary infighting that creates the problem. So that corporate Trinidad, the easy answer, as I keep telling people, and I've been on both sides of the fence, right? is to say no. So the first answer, you come in, you want funding as a, a sporting body, whatever, whatever. The easy thing is to say no first, because then no kills the conversation, it ends, and you go away and they could utilize their own scarce resource for whatever else, including maybe other altruistic things, maybe, you know, Red Cross or, you know, one of those other institutions or something where they don't think there's confusion. So confusion is, a, is definitely something that gives the, the, the corporations additional ammunition to say no. Then, of course, there was the whole issue of accountability, right? And very often, accountability isn't where it needs to be. As I say, we've been working with NGBs. And even when it is where it needs to be, very often it's misrepresented for the internal politicking reasons, which I have personally no time for. I think that you know, we should just get on with it and not be our own worst enemy, as I keep telling them in you know, sessions where I speak to the NGB membership of various organizations, or when they come crying to me for one reason or another. I say, that's fine. Work, get it sorted out. But don't be the one that creates the problem. Because when you destroy the institution's image, and then you get what you want, which is maybe to lead it or whatever, it's not going to change. You go to me, the, the you know, private enterprise, I still the institution that, that they have in their head, destroyed, right? So you got to be very careful. So I think that's a problem. I think there's always room for more, in my mind, that the sport, that um, private sector could do. Unquestionably so, so I agree with the, with, the, with the Prime Minister on that score. But then there are very many exceptional private sector people who have supported sport for as long as I could remember. And to be honest, I have been in, as a sports administrator for just over 50 years now. Right? So definitely before you born. And I have to say that some of them seem to have been around from then. To know. Again, I don't want to sing loud for people to say uh, cherry picking and picking and choosing, um, but they have consistently supported sport and sport in many ways. Sometimes specific sports, sometimes sport in general, the Olympic Committee, but the whole issue of sport. So some private enterprise does, but many, 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 
don't. Most don't. Let's be blunt. Most don't. Because there are thousands of companies and thousands don't support sport. Mr. Camacho, what can we expect from the sports company of uh, Trinidad and Tobago in the coming year? Well, definitely we have a very busy schedule. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, we have in a, a LOC meeting, which have, you know, other sports people, sport TT people would be attending on my behalf since I'm here at, um, with you all on this program. But the when the T20 is finished, right after that, we have the Master Swimming, which is a huge event. You know, they expect somewhere between two and 600 people, athletes. There's the possibility of the eldest athlete being 105. We wait to see. We try and encourage her to come. Person who still swims out of Canada. Um, so that's a big one right after literally one week rest and straight into that. Straight when we come out of that, we get into the IPL. I'm just talking about the ones that Sport TT is chairing the LOCs of. And then when we come out of, of those, we have the preparing for Carifta next year. And possibly in between there, there may be a hockey tournament um, as a qualifier for Junior Pan Ams, I believe it is, which would be maybe early 2025. So a lot of activity in that regard. Um, as I say, we have the, from the physical infrastructure, because, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, the two main dimensions of our work. From the physical infrastructure perspective, we do have the ASD Crawford, which we need to ensure is completed. Our target is by 31st December, which really means before. Because we really want the facility to be tested, particularly for the track and field part. The field we'll have no doubt about, but it's certainly the track which will be internationally certified. We don't, that is an independent body. So there'll be that coming down the pipeline. In between there, we have some ITF stuff, tennis stuff, a whole host of it taking place, particularly over the holiday period here. So a very busy schedule, um, packed, but that's what we are appointed to do, right? To be the implementation arm in certain areas for the for the state and where sport is concerned. Your final thoughts? I think my, my real thing is two things you touched upon that I think is critical for sport to go forward. One would be private sector getting more engaged. Two, the engagement generally in a broader way of people back into sport. That COVID really has been a terrible knockdown on us. And, you know, we have started a program which the minister has really been very supportive of. The umbrella name is I Choose Sport. Brilliant name, but it really is to reach out to athletes, grassroots, communities, working with NGBs, working with the schools. We actually have the schools as a partner in it, doing things ourselves through people, through the sports company of Trinidad and Tobago, running caravans, both in Trinidad and in Tobago, and the overall umbrella, I choose sport. So when somebody says, why you do it? I choose sport. Why you in this? I choose sport. So it must become a way of life for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Because I think it will so not solve, but help with a lot of other issues that we face and a lot of other costs that we don't add up. But there's medicine. The cost, if people are healthier, you have less demands on the state. The deviant behavior, crime. I mean, Atu was on the United Nations talking about that yesterday or the day before, right? You're, it is a catalyst. If you could take people and put them into a meaningful thing, ultimately, if, if you get that grassroots program going, then the NGBs, which is really what the original purpose of the sports company was, and their focus there, they will have a bigger pool to choose from. So you can't choose from what you don't have. So the bigger the pool, the more choice you will have, right? So we're hoping for that, and that that... The phrase I like to use and I've used forever since ever is cradle to grave. So we would like to see little children, ideally primary school, secondary school, tertiary, right through to, as I said, the lady who might come to swim at 105, right? Participating in sport as a way of life, a healthy lifestyle choice. So that, that program that, that, that we have going with I Choose Sport and is all over the country now and Trinidad and all over Tobago, um, hopefully, we'll continue to get the funding from the state for it. We didn't get any extra in the midterm. As you see, 11, 
11 ministries got, sport wasn't one of them. Maybe if we had wanted to make it a nice wrong dozen, sport might have been the 12th, I don't know, Minister of Finance maybe. But certainly if we could continue to get more funding so that we could invest more into the youth, into the, the programs, and I think that is the key. If we could get more programs running more consistently and not start and stop, I think, you know, it would be in a good place. I'd feel, you know, I could sit back in a, at home at some stage and say, look at what Trinidad is, you know, we have changed the culture of this place into a sporting nation, not an armchair sporting nation, which is what we have right now. What are we doing to find and develop these young, budding athletes? Well, exactly. So th this is where the I choose sport is so critical in my, in my mind, you know. We're going into the schools because, you know, parents. A lot of schools, parents, sport is a distraction from work rather than sport is a critical ingredient in developing a human person, right? So we're into the schools through this I choose sports overarching program. We're working with the NGBs. So you have programs going all over, all over. You have Badri running cricket all over. You have the hockey people running programs. You know, you have football running what they call the, the um, coastline program. So we work with the NGBs and programs because they're the ones, again, with the resource. To the extent that some don't have the resource, we supplement. And that's what we have to do. So this I2 sport is to get into the communities through the NGBs, through the education, education system right, through clubs and, and, and church groups and, I mean, it's amazing the people that we have interacted with now that we have started this. And at the end of the day, resources, physical, we have the plant, I think, we have enough sporting facilities. I mentioned all the colleges that empty, have all the schools that have grounds that empty, all the schools, colleges, secondary schools, convents, whatever all of them that have sporting facilities, underutilized in the sense, right? To really try and, and, and bring it all together and make it happen. We have to make it happen, we as a people. Mr. Camacho, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's been a very fruitful discussion on so many issues and I, I know we have so many things coming up in terms of sport. We have the, the ICC T20 World Cup that's currently ongoing. We have the qualification that has started for the Soka Warriors. Uh, we have Olympics coming up in the you know, just, uh, just about a month or so. And as you said, Karifta is uh, in 2025 and so much more in sport. Yep, plenty up, man. Thank you very much, Anil. Been a pleasure as always. Join us at the same time next week for another episode of Delving Deeper. And as we close, on behalf of the entire crew, we would like to wish a hearty congratulations to your regular host, Ayana Carter, on the birth of her beautiful baby girl. I am Sonolala. Have a great night.